Welcome to the Green Chemistry Education Webinar Series by the Green Chemistry Commitment. My name is Kate Anderson, and I'm the Director of Education for Beyond Benign, a nonprofit organization dedicated to green chemistry education. Today I am filling in for Dr. Amy Cannon, who has been delayed returning to Boston due to the storm that we've had here in New England. Quite a lot of snow the past week. This webinar series is designed to highlight relevant topics in green chemistry education for faculty and students. Our goal is to provide resources for faculty and students who are looking to adopt green chemistry in their courses and programs. Thank you all for joining us, and we'd like to give a special shout out to the group tuning in from University of Colorado Boulder. Sorry, sorry, got a little carried away there. Um, now, before we begin, I would like to give you some technical information about this webinar. We are broadcasting live and recording this session. Therefore, all attendees are in listen-only mode and all lines are muted. If you have a question, please type the question into the question box on your control panel for the moderators to view. We will respond to as many questions as we can after Dr. Anastas' presentation. The webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be posted on the link you see in the welcome box and this PowerPoint presentation. Any supporting documents, such as presentation slides, will be posted there as well. This webinar is brought to you as a part of the Green Chemistry Commitment Program, which is a consortium program aimed at transforming chemistry education, expanding the community of green chemistry practitioners, growing departmental resources for those looking to adopt green chemistry, improving connections to industry, and affecting systemic change in chemistry education. The program is a voluntary, flexible program for adopting green chemistry student learning objectives and for promoting the work that you are currently doing at your institution. You can serve as models for other institutions to get involved with green chemistry. You can find more information at the link, greenchemistrycommitment.org, and you can also email Amy directly at amycannon at beyondbenign.org. As an addition to the webinar series, we will be paying tribute to an inspirational leader in the field of green chemistry who passed away last year, Dr. Al Matlack. Dr. Matlack was a researcher spending his career at Hercules and DuPont, an educator at the University of Delaware, and an author, authoring the first comprehensive textbook on green chemistry in 2001 called An Introduction to Green Chemistry. His family donated several copies of the second edition book published in 2010, and we will be giving away a copy of this textbook to one lucky webinar participant during each of the first several webinars in the series. We will announce the randomly selected winner from our list of attendees. At the end of the webinar, we will send the textbook directly to you. The winner will receive an email from us requesting your information immediately following the webinar. At this point, I would like to introduce our webinar speaker, Dr. Nicholas Anastas. Dr. Nicholas Anastas is a senior advisor for green chemistry at the US EPA's Office of Research and Development. In this capacity, Nick is responsible for integrating fundamental research results with management and policy strategies to promote and provide safer, healthier, and sustainable products to the marketplace. He has led the New England Green Chemistry Initiative for the last three years in, region, in EPA Region 1. Nicholas has over 25 years of experience as a professional toxicologist, risk assessor, and environmental analytical chemist in both the private and public sectors. He teaches chemical toxicology at the University of Massachusetts Boston as part of the chemistry department. Nick also holds a doctorate in environmental studies with a concentration in green chemistry from the U University of Massachusetts Boston and a master's degree in pharmacology from the Graduate School of Pharmacy at Northeastern University. Nick will be talking with us about embedding toxicology into the chemistry curriculum. All right, I am now going to give Nick the controls.
Uh, sorry about that. Just a little button. Sorry about that. A little delay there. We're just transferring it over for Nick's slides to come on up. Hmm. All right. Terrific. Slides are there. Take it away, Nick. Okay. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Kate. I would like to thank you and uh, Beyond Benign and the Green Chemistry Commitment uh, for inviting me to participate in this important series on toxicology and chemical education in the 21st century. Um, and I also want to th thank everybody for taking the time out of their day uh, to spend some time here today uh, to discuss this. Uh, I know it's quite uh, quite snowy and nasty, and I'm, I'm glad people are here. Um, I've uh, recently assumed the position of Senior Advisor for Green Chemistry uh, out of uh, the Office of Research and Development in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But uh, those of you who have been involved with the Region 1 efforts are familiar uh, with uh, the, group's, the group's mission and with uh, EPA's mission in general to bring together uh, interdisciplinary sciences, including toxicology, chemistry, uh, environmental studies, all in the, uh, for the goal of developing and designing safer, healthier, and sustainable materials. So um, today we're going to talk about and focus more on embedding uh, specifically toxicology into the chemistry curriculum, because this is an important uh, step forward, and I believe it's the next uh, logical step in the path uh, in green chemistry. And uh, hopefully offer uh, uh, identify some opportunities for interdisciplinary training um, up here. Uh, so we'll <clears throat> first of all show how chemistry and green chemistry and toxicology are uh, interrelated, show the different points of connection, overlap, and opportunities to use uh, each one of the those fundamental sciences to uh, enhance the other. And the focus of this talk <clears throat> is going to be pretty much on the role of the toxicologist in designing uh, safer chemicals. And we'll hopefully see that it, it's an important role. And I would like to point out that with 21st century toxicology and development of high throughput screening, we can bring the toxicologist to the discussion table and um, allow the, the person to be in at the, uh, the, the design discussions. Um, and then from there, take it into opportunities to incorporate toxicology uh, into the chemistry curriculum. And hopefully people will see that there are a myriad opportunities to do that. Um, chemistry has been called the central science of fundamental science. And we'll see how that uh, interacts with, uh, with toxicology as well. I'll provide a few examples, and uh, one in uh, particular, and then also provide you with some resources and um, some next steps in uh, where we can go from here. Um, so a little bit about uh, what uh, the National Risk Management Research Laboratory uh, does. Uh, NORML is one of 14 laboratories in the Office of Research and Development. And it is involved in both intramural and uh, funding extramural uh, fundamental research. Mm -hmm. um, these research areas include climate change, um, groundwater and um, drinking water restoration, uh, land use, um, and also sustainable technologies. And that's where green chemistry uh, is one of the major focus areas. And under that um, research rubric uh, include fundamental green chemistry um, principles, for example, catalysis, green synthesis, and process intensification. <clears throat> the normal lab also is involved in developing analytical tools, uh, primarily computer-based, that link chemical toxicology with chemical design and uh, risk reduction. You can see a few of them outlined there, um, including TEST, which is a toxicology estimation 
uh, software package, uh, the Paris software package, uh, which assists university laboratories, industrial laboratories for choosing um, less hazardous, greener uh, solvents. And all of these, uh, I'll put a reference at the end, uh, these are all available and downloadable uh, for your use. Uh, so you can see that there are a number of uh, a number of innovative research tools that have been going on at at NERMAL. Um, innovation has been uh, central to their work. Over 400 peer-reviewed manuscripts, uh, many many presentations to the public, uh, to go other governmental agencies, and you can see that the collaboration, both uh, internally and externally, is uh, uh, is tremendous. So uh, I just wanted to. Uh, thank them for uh, providing me with this opportunity. And so for those people who are not familiar with uh, green chemistry and where we're going, um, a little background on the, on the origins of green chemistry. Um, green chemistry was developed back in the early uh, 1990s as um, part of the Alternative Synthetic Pathways uh, for Pollution Prevention Workgroup uh, out of OPPT and EPA. Um, it was developed primarily by synthetic organic chemists um, looking to develop and advance um, advance ways to uh, reduce the toxicity of existing uh, synthetic reactions. Um, in the 20 years, 20 plus years that uh, green chemistry has um, has been in practice, it has it has seen uh, tremendous advancements, uh, innovation has a reduction and has been a tremendous success. Um, the majority of the referee publications, as we've seen over those 20 years, um, focus on certain areas. I mentioned one before, catalysis. Uh, but many are solvent substitutions. And much of the discussion does not focus on toxicity. The synthetic changes, whether it's from an existing, changing an, exi an existing synthetic pathway or developing a new synthetic pathway, um, eliminates known toxic chemicals from, from that pathway. Uh, for example, uh, methylene chloride and trichloroethylene. So the opportunities are there for taking green chemistry and focusing on two of the, two of the principles more closely. Principles three and four. <clears throat> um, and this is where you have to engage the toxicologist. So um, without applying the principles of toxicology, designing safer chemicals is inefficient at best. The synthetic chemists are tremendously skilled at moving molecules and understanding what uh, reactions are going on at the molecular level, but without understanding the, the primary relationship between structure and hazard, uh, the task of designing safer chemicals. Uh, becomes more difficult. Um, all aspects of toxicology inform chemical design. Um, what we're trying to do in educating the next generation of chemists in toxicology is to seek common ground among chemists, toxicologists, uh, and other allied partners. Um, because we will see as we go through this that there are many similarities that may not be obvious um, to those of us who are trained specifically in in different, uh, uh, different focus areas. But we will see that the, uh, the opportunities are there. And one of, the, one of the key factors that we'll see is the toxicologists and other scientists must be part of the molecular design team from the beginning. Right now, um, the, the more, most common case is that the toxicologist is brought in at the end of a design process. Um, the pharmaceutical industry is addressing that. Um, and has been addressing that for, for many years. And we need to bring that into the, um, into the industrial side of things. Um, so the main idea is to how to avoid molecular mayhem. Looking at a molecule and understand when a molecule is dangerous. When is it dangerous enough to be a menace? Can you tell just by, by its appearance, by a two-dimensional structure? And we'll see that there are tools to address that. But they may not be sufficient enough. Um, so those topics need to be discussed. Uh, and so what does 
a chemist in a common or a traditional uh, chemistry curriculum need to be aware of. Well, there's a hierarchy of toxicological information that chemists need to understand to design safer molecules. The first one is the mechanism and mode of action. And the mechanism of action can be an adverse consequence, it can be an intended a action, uh, or in the case that's uh, more common, a physical action. Explosivity, corrosivity, flammability. But the mechanism of action is provides the most information to uh, chemists to influence uh, adverse endpoints. Second down there is QSA, which stands for Quantitative Structure Activity Relationships. And we're familiar with this with the Hammond equation, um, with the Taft equation. So chemists are familiar with QSARs, but not in a toxicological sense. So there's another opportunity to, to put them both together. Uh, kinetics and dynamics. Chemists are familiar with both of those terms. Pharmacologists and toxicologists refer to them as pharmaco and toxicokinetics and pharmaco and toxicodynamics. So understanding that there is another way to, another opportunity may help uh, uh, physical chemists to incorporate toxicology. And the last one is availability. Can a molecule actually make it to its target site? And there are fundamental um, physicochemical properties that we can look at uh, to, uh, to influence that. So understanding, I, I believe uh, we're trying to make the case that <clears throat> toxicological consequences, adverse outcomes, rely on fundamental chemical principles. They cannot violate the principles of, of, uh, of chemistry. So <clears throat> with that understanding, what can we do? What can we understand? How can we incorporate this into a, uh, a standing chemistry curriculum? Uh, there are many ways to do it. And I've listed three here. There are many more. And um, many of you on the phone have, uh, uh, have been intimately involved with, with some of these uh, efforts for, for many years. Um, the first of all is a standalone loan course in, in chemical toxicology. Uh, that's what I do over at the University of Massachusetts. Um, my chemical toxicology course is geared specifically for uh, the Green Chemistry PhD program over there. So this is a standalone course um, that is um, quite intensive, and it goes over toxicology in, in, in quite a bit of detail. So that may be one way you want to go. A second way to do it, because of the limitations in a very crowded curriculum, is to find ways to embed uh, the principles of toxicology into an existing topic in the chemistry course, and I'll hopefully show that a little bit later. And the third one is a little bit more um, uh, free form, uh, offer a seminar or readings course. So a specific um, topic or a specific uh, speaker could come in um, and discuss the relationship between uh, toxicology uh, and chemistry. <clears throat> Many universities have uh, pharmacology or toxicology um, programs within, within the university. So um, one opportunity is to get together and discuss uh, with your toxicology or pharmacology department, um, and also the biochemistry department, opportunities um, to partner. And um, mechanistic toxicology um, is becoming uh, much more refined, is becoming a mature science now. And so I think the opportunities for uh, collaboration between and among departments is, is going to become um, uh, much greater. The other way to do it is to hire adjunct faculty. If you don't have expertise uh, within your college or university, um, there are many experts out there who have, um, who have the desire, who have the experience to provide a, um, a standalone course. So they can provide the principles of toxicology, not in a way where we're looking to turn chemists into uh, diplomats of the American Board of Toxicology. Uh, what we're trying to do is inform them of the principles of toxicology and how those principles can be included in a chemistry course and, and again, uh, reaffirm that, uh, that fundamental connection. Um, the other way probably could be is to have a reciprocal, reciprocal agreement with another institution that has an existing 
um, either green chemistry course that focuses on toxicology or a chemical toxicology course. So there are a few ideas. I'm sure there are uh, several more that can be uh, that can be articulated. <clears throat> for most of the for most of the uh, individuals on the line, I assume that embedding principles uh, as, as seamlessly as possible in the in the curriculum that you're teaching now is is probably one of the best options. And so what I've laid out here is um, one way that uh, has worked in the course that I teach uh, to get across the concept and um, kind of putting your toe in the water uh, of that little stream that lies between uh, chemistry and toxicology right now. And it is based on concept alignment. So uh, just going through, and here are only uh, uh, five or six examples of where these opportunities uh, lie right now um, in the curriculum, covalent uh, bonding. As you're discussing covalent bonding in, in, a, in an abstract way, um, include the inhibition of acetylcholinesterase. Acetylcholinesterase is, a <clears throat> uh, is an enzyme required for the breakdown of acetylcholine, and it has many adverse consequences. Uh, uh, this is the way that pesticides are toxic, nerve gases work, and so this is a fundamental reaction of, uh, fundamental toxic reaction. But when you look at the mechanism of how um, <clears throat> these compounds actually inhibit acetylcholinesterase, it is based on covalent binding, and also um, it is based on non-covalent covalent binding as well. So uh, looking at the actual mechanism, that can be used as a specific example of taking covalent bonding, a covalent binding, and linking it with the toxic endpoint. Um, many toxic compounds are electrophiles. So discussing SN1, SN2 reactions, electrophiles and nucleophiles, um, instead of using our groups and abstract um, uh, abstract discussions, use DNA. The N7 of guanine is one of the most uh, nucleophilic sites on DNA. And many of the compounds that cause cancer, are the mechanism is an electrophilic binding. And so just taking it to, ne to, to the next step and include uh, one example and show the mechanism of, of that. Entropy and free energy. Uh, discussing um, uh, delta G, other components of uh, uh, the free energy equation, membrane disruption is governed by, by free energy. And for a molecule to uh, transverse from one side of a membrane to another to get to, to the site of toxicological action, it has to go through a membrane. And understanding that that is, is governed by the fundamental laws of chemistry is important. Um, electromagnetic radiation, ozone depletion. Now that really is not a toxic effect, but it is a hazardous effect. And that this would provide an opportunity to describe hazard versus toxicity. And toxic toxicity is one particular hazard. So we're looking at a global hazard here. Uh, in uh, electromagnetic radiation, radiation UV, uh, disrupts DNA, gas loss. When we look at Boyle's law, Child's law, that's, that's part of the chemistry curriculum. How does that influence inhalation exposure? And one example that is used here is Henry's law, which is very critical to risk assessment. So <clears throat> inhaling, um, uh, inhaling solvents, what is that governed by? You know, is the compound volatile enough uh, to uh, be part of an exposure route that includes inhalation? So the gas laws can be incorporated into that. Ester hydrolysis, um, that's fundamental. But now we're going not to toxicity, but to biodegradability. So there, are, there are a few examples, a few examples there. Uh, seminar readings or special topic scores. This is a a way to do it uh, completely open. So whatever focus area you happen to be be comfortable with, you can set up an entire uh, an entire discussion, an entire seminar series, just based on your area of expertise. And so that uh, bridges the gap and gets, uh, again, put your toe in the water of, uh, of toxicology and chemistry. 
um, and you can focus on a PRN per ray nota basis. And the reason I put that in there is because you'll see a pharmacologist call it PRN as uh, as necessary. And so, getting to know the 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 lexicon, knowing to know, getting to know the language, is part of any um, academic discussion. So, using these terms over and over um, provides an opportunity to take people to the next step. And so, I, I alluded to this before, but without understanding understanding the relationship between structure and hazard, and in this case, the hazard we're talking about is toxicity, um, it's impossible to design to design a less hazardous chemical. Um, and again, design implies uh, intent. Um, stressing the fact that hazard is just an, a fundamental molecular property, no different than boiling point, melting point, um, electronegativity. Hazard is a fundamental molecular property. That should be one of the, uh, one of the discussion points in any um, undergraduate uh, curriculum. Um, so now we'll get down to the uh, a couple of examples here of where we can actually look at specific examples of linking molecular structure to to hazard. Um, I'm only going to go over a few. There, there are obviously many, many more. But um, avoiding toxic of force structural features known to bestow toxicity. So again, there's this new language in here, but toxicophores, pharmacophores. Uh, a toxicophore is a part of a molecule that, um, that is responsible for the toxicity. A pharmacophore is the part of the molecule that is responsible for the therapeutic action of a medicine. And so again, here's an opportunity to, to link very uh, very familiar compounds with particular structures. Mechanism of aspirin, so we can go over those. <clears throat> um, so you see there on the, the left-hand side uh, examples of electrophiles, uh, alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl and related groups, uh, general structures of these compounds. Um, types of nucleophilic reactions, and you see there a, an example of Michael addition. It's a very common, uh, commonly taught uh, part of the chemistry, uh, especially organic, discussion. But instead of stopping at um, reactions just in, that are obvious in a, in a laboratory, take it to the next step and say, what you're doing in this, this particular round bottom flask or um, this particular uh, experiment in the laboratory, <clears throat> because it is reactive, because these compounds are undergoing uh, reactions in the flask, think one step outside the flask, and exposure to human beings, to other living organisms, can result in cancer and mutations, liver toxicity, kidney toxicity. So there's a whole range of, of different um, endpoints. And again, an opportunity to link back not only the reactivity of these compounds, because many times reactivity is needed for a reaction to go. That makes, that makes sense. Um, but here are some, some examples. Isocyanates. There are addition reactions, and <clears throat> excuse me, um, they have been linked to cancer, mutagenicity, uh, pulmonary, pulmonary sensitization. An example here is looking at methyl isocyanate and using that as a specific example um, of where a compound was used in Bhopal, India, as part of a synthetic scheme to synthesize pesticides. And that resulted in um, uh, tens of thousands of deaths uh, due to pulmonary, uh, pulmonary toxicity. And we can discuss the, uh, uh, we can discuss the uh, mechanisms there, too. And here are just some more examples. They, but the point is that you can go to the literature and find examples of where molecular structures through, through toxico uh, toxicological testing in animals, uh, in in vitro studies, uh, high throughput screening assays have been linked to a toxic outcome. And there are, the literature is, uh, uh, is, is full of those. So uh, 
here are examples of where you can uh, where you can incorporate these uh, these ideas. Uh, here's another one where ethylene glycol ethers uh, have been shown to cause reproductive and developmental toxicity. Well, here's the uh, mechanism that has been worked out. Um, general when uh, general structures of glycol ethers are presented in a uh, in an organic chemistry course, you could use this example by saying alcohol dehydrogenase, which is a an enzyme in the body, uh, results in a metabolite that's called alkoxyacetic acid. This compound has been linked to reproductive and developmental toxicity. Okay, so there's an example, but you can take that to the next step. How can we, is there a way to, as a synthetic chemist, if I know the mechanism, now we're getting into the design rules, if I know the mechanism of how this compound, how this structure reacts in the body and results in a, tox, a toxic endpoint, is there something I can do uh, as, a, as a molecular designer to reduce or even eliminate toxicity? And in this case, here's an example of where it has been done. Um, adding a, uh, an alkyl um, side group actually prevents the cytochrome P450 uh, from, um, uh, from um, causing that toxic, as we see up here. The alkoxyacetic acid cannot be formed now because we have that, uh, uh, that methyl group right next to the, uh, the hydroxy group. So this is a way to take it to the next step and say, Okay, we understand the relationship between structure and hazard, and now we're looking at the toxicology data. We're working with toxicologists to understand the mechanism of how these compounds result in toxicity. Is there a way to take it even further and start designing these chemicals? So we, we don't. We the toxicologists at the end will say toxicity is low. That's uh, you know that's the uh, that's the ultimate goal. Um, and here's just an example of. Uh, a specific example of nitriles. For nitriles are used ubiquitously in the laboratory, in industry, uh, as intermediates, as solvents, as and uh, there are many different uh, structural types. Um, the mechanism of action of toxicity, the acute toxicity of nitriles, has been worked out uh, very nicely. And you can see from this uh, particular uh, scheme here that the alpha, uh, that the, the um, hydrogen, alpha hydrogen next to the cyanogroup group is key uh, for toxicity here. So you need to form that, um, uh, that radical, that alpha radical right next to the cyanogroup group to result in acute lethality. Um, and the acute lethality is, as we can see down at the bottom, uh, is attributed to the availability of cyanide. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so this is an acutely toxic compound because of the adverse effects of cyanide on um, um, oxygen, uh, oxidation. Uh, and here is just a <clears throat> um, the same. If you look at the middle, of the, the same mechanism. But from these data, you can see that nitriles that form a more stable radical at the alpha carbon tend to be more lethal. So we, 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 the data came from examining the structure activity relationships. A series of nitriles were tested at the LD50. And here again, we need to know what an LD50 is. So uh, there's going to be some, uh, there's a learning curve in learning the terminology, the nomenclature. Uh, LD50 is the dose of a compound that is toxic to 50% of a population. So examining the LD50s for different structural types and showed that um, if a more radical st uh, structure can be uh, developed at the alpha carbon, there is more lethality here. And here's an example of comparing those data. <clears throat> and we have acetonitrile, propionitrile, uh, butonitrile, and several others. So you have the structures at the top. And down the bottom, you have a series of LD50 values that were obtained from the, in this case, uh, the literature. This is from um, DeVito et al., 1995. And another concept that comes through is 
a more toxic compound is going to have a lower LD50. Because the concept of an LD50 is it's the dose that kills, that is toxic, or in this case, lethal, to 50% of the population. So a lower dose is more toxic. So examining the data there, you can see what particular features are associated with a higher or lower uh, LD50, in this case, acute, acute lethality. And so, as I was alluding to before, uh, we want to get to design rules. We want to incorporate design into our, into our discussions. And uh, hopefully we can develop a chemist's roadmap to design for hazard reduction. So design rules, guidelines, um, whatever terminology uh, people use, um, they're science-based, as we, as we just saw. They're based on uh, identification of a mechanism, which is the highest level uh, of understanding and usefulness, quantitative structure activity relationships, um, kinetic and thermodynamic data. So design rules, as we roll them out, um, are science-based empirically derived through animal studies, uh, or they can be developed through modeling. And we've, we've, we've seen that. And what it is, as I gave a quick example there, is just connecting the dots between structure and hazard. You know, if we have this particular structure here, what is the, the end point? And then we can get down to the uh, quantitative structure activity relationships. And I want to emphasize there's quite a bit of professional judgment involved, too. Expert um, <clears throat> expert uh, discussions of um, uh, that only can come from experience. So we need several lines of data to support our conclusions um, of which 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 molecular features um, are responsible for a particular toxic endpoint. And uh, to emphasize here, there is there is no compound that has only one particular toxic endpoint. The comp the uh, the nitrile is what I showed uh, earlier, those data were for LD50. That's acute toxicity. There are other endpoints that need to be considered um, in developing safer compounds. So when you're minimizing for one particular endpoint, realize that there needs to be a spectrum of toxic endpoints evaluated uh, for a compound to be uh, uh, safer. And uh, again, for the how do we actually articulate these design rule examples for nitriles? Um, <clears throat> the rules are, and these come from uh, Steve uh, DeVito, uh, 1996, um, to develop a new or redesign an existing nitrile for a particular purpose, um, provide steric hindrance at the alpha carbon. Because the bulkier it is at that alpha carbon, restricts the, um, the accessibility of the P450 enzyme to extract that hydrogen. So that is one strategy. That is one design rule. Add groups that reduce alpha radical stability. Another, uh, another design um, option. And also from the data, from just uh, lining the data up and seeing what the data said, um, avoid heteroatoms containing <clears throat> groups on the alpha carbon. So don't put in nitrogen uh, containing oxygen, sulfur-containing groups. And again, these came from examination uh, of, of, of the data. And so now a few more examples. Those are specific examples of, um, actually just uh, two specific examples of where you can expand in your, in your chemistry course. Here are a few others. On the left-hand side, you'll see what uh, particular topic you're discussing. And on the right-hand side, some examples of where these, where these can be applied in a toxicological sense. pH. pH is very important in many things, as we, as we well know, but it's also very important in absorption. Um, an example is curare. Curare is well-absorbed uh, IM, intramuscular, because the pH is 7.4. Curare has a quaternary ammonium, a quart I'm sorry, a quaternary nitrogen in its structure. So a pH of 7.4 in the muscle is different from the GI, which has a pH of about 1, 1.5. So <clears throat> a medicine man in the, in the jungle who 
you know, shoots a, a, shoots a monkey with a curare laden arrow, can cut the meat out and swallow it and have very little toxicity because pH is dictating the structure of that molecule. In this case, curare, that it's not absorbed well through the stomach. So there's, there's a way to show um, a relationship between adjusting pH and absorption. Uh, there are many other examples in the pharmacology uh, literature, in the pharmacy literature. Um, it's, done, it's done all the time. Um, talking about oxidation, most pHs are very unreactive. Most hydrocarbons are very unreactive unless they're bioactivated. Benzene itself is really not all that toxic. It needs to be metabolized, oxidized to an epoxide to have um, its toxic effect, which is generally acting as, a, as an electrophile in DNA. Um, alkylation, spoke about that earlier. Alkylation reactions are very common uh, with reactive, comp uh, with, with reactive um, uh, nucleophiles on DNA, RNA, and proteins. Uh, isomerization, when you're looking at isomers, a perfect example is thalidomide. Thalidomide is a compound that was used in the 1950s and 60s uh, as, a, as a sedative, um, and it was given to uh, pregnant women. One of the isomers, the R isomer, is actually teratogenic. It caused birth defects. So something as small as just an R versus an S isomer can have a huge difference in toxicity endpoints. PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. The most toxic polychlorinated biphenyls are the uh, nonpolar, uh, I'm sorry, nonplanar PCBs. So you're looking at different isomers, different congeners in this case of PCBs, whose toxicity varies based on the structure. Um, quinine and quinidine are two different uh, isomers as well. Um, one's a, an antiarrhythmic drug, and the other one is uh, used against uh, malaria. Pi stacking, non-covalent uh, interactions. Um, intercalate into DNA and in, uh, disrupt the structure of DNA, often resulting in um, carcinogenic effects. Uh, Bioisosteres and um, oxidation reduction reactions. Nitrate-nitrite um, ratios. Uh, the nitrate uh, molecule itself is really not all that toxic. The nitrite um, part of that oxidation reduction reaction is the toxic, toxic component that results in blue baby syndrome, which is actually called methemoglobinemia. So looking at the ratio between nitrite and, and nitrate involves oxidation reduction, as does chromium into, into, the whole, into, into metals. Chromium-3 is... is uh, has minimal toxicity. Chromium-6 is extremely toxic, and it is a known human carcinogen. So these are some, uh, some opportunities to take standard, um, uh, standard topics in a, a chemistry course and an organic course and link them with uh, a toxic outpoint. I'm sorry, a toxic, uh, toxic endpoint. <clears throat> so now some, uh, uh, some resources and uh, uh, just to sum up, um, some background reading is, is probably going to be uh, be required. <laughs> um, and uh, some of these are uh, quite deep, and some are you know actually very uh, uh, very readable. Cassaret and Duell's toxicology, the basic science of poison, is and has been uh, for many many years the uh, essentially the uh, primary text uh, for practicing toxicologists. Uh, most of the questions on the exam for the um, uh, Society of Toxicology uh, uh, test are taken out of Cassaret and Duels. It's very deep, very detailed. Uh, but Chapter 3, I think, uh, chemists would benefit quite a bit from because that is a mechanistic side of, uh, of toxicology and many of the many more examples of electrophiles, nucleophiles uh, are provided there. Uh, e. Hodson's book uh, is good. Uh, uh, Sterley's book, Me Mechanistic Toxicology, provides um, a myriad of examples of the relationship between structure and, and hazard. So that's another, 
another tremendous um, uh, resource. For a primer on toxicology, the National Library of Medicine has a very nice uh, summary, which is not not all that technical, which would be, I think would be useful uh, for chemists who are um, just beginning in toxicology. Uh, at US EPA, we have uh, we're tremendously lucky to have cutting edge chemists at not only at ORD Normal in uh, Cincinnati, but also down at our uh, Research Triangle Park Lab, the National Center for Compu Computational Toxicology. Um, and <clears throat> both groups and other groups have developed web-based resources uh, that can be downloaded. And so I've, I've provided uh, uh, a few there. Also, uh, OCSPP is the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention. Um, information on safer products, not just uh, the labeling part of it, but actually how to perform an alternatives assessment. And for those who want to delve a little bit more deeply um, into risk assessment, taking toxicology and applying it to risk assessment, uh, that, that's, a very, uh, that's a very good study right there. So in, uh, in summary, uh, I've, I've tried to provide some examples of adopting toxicology and um, expanding that to hazard evaluation into the chemistry curriculum that already exists because um, from from what I hear, and um, it, it certainly is true that trying to put one more one more requirement into the chemistry curriculum is a challenge, and we need to be innovative. We need to be uh, clever in finding ways to put them to uh, to partner and, and find ways to uh, uh, to augment the existing chemistry curriculum. Um, but the good part is there are options. Uh, flexibility is key. And uh, I know of several, uh, several programs across the country that are uh, um, ex extremely uh, successful at doing that. And again, w the goal here is not to train chemists as uh, DABTs, diplomats of the American Board of Toxicology. So we're not trying to, to take it to the point where Every chemist needs to be to have the same training as a uh, as a practice, practicing toxicologist. However, I believe that there is a need for chemists to a understand what the potential toxicity is of the compounds, the chemicals, uh, the materials they are working with in the laboratory. I think that's incumbent upon uh, both staff, faculty, and students to understand that uh, and to understand when to call in a toxicologist. When is it time for me um, to put somebody in and discuss my synthetic scheme, what I'm doing here with the toxicologist? And ideally, that would be at the point of uh, when pencil meets uh, paper. Um, <clears throat> so that is pretty much what we, what I'd like to get across. The opportunities are. Um, a tremendous. I think this is the perfect time to take green chemistry, <clears throat> and as we embed green chemistry into the chemistry curriculum, we can also focus more, more deeply on principles three, principles four, on the toxicology part of um, green chemistry, and bring that along as well, because a lot of the low-hanging fruit has been harvested. So now we have to look at existing chemicals, existing. Uh, uh, pathways and find and, and look more deeply at the toxicity of what's what is in commerce and find safer alternatives for that whether it's using 21st century toxicology tools for the evaluation and alternatives assessment or using those same tools the same tools of 21st century toxicology green toxicology and designing safer chemical and in the chemistry literature I see used quite frequently. Um, this is an elegant synthesis. The synthetic pathway was elegant. Um, on, a, on an editorial note, any synthesis that involves unintentional use or production of a toxic chemical shouldn't be labeled elegant. So, <laughs> unless pesticides or herbicides are being, um, being produced, hopefully they're produced, being synthesized a, in a uh, very safe way, sustainable way, 
and the end product is very selective for the organism that is uh, for the target organism. So, and I just would like to thank Dr. Stephen DeVito of US EPA's um, a TRI program uh, for essentially all the structures and tex technical expertise. Uh, Dr. DeVito is uh, a leader in this field of designing safer chemicals. Um, and also ORD and uh, Normal and Region 1 for all the, all the support and uh, leadership. So, and I uh, thank you again for your time and your attention. Thank you very much, Nick. You're welcome. That was terrific. And at this time, we're going to open up to questions. Oops, sorry. I'm having a hard time. Oh, there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions. Oh. Uh, John Pyers. So a lot of questions, and I guess I'm going to I'm going to start with one right here, and then I'm going to get to the ones that we've got um, from the audience. And how about um, are there any? Well, and and you had actually alluded to this um, in 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 the talk too, um, but a, you know the resources you you mentioned the resources so I'm not going to read out that one but how how do you how would you get started if you know where where would be that first first place to to get started if you're a professor looking to to start to integrate this into your classwork yeah um, that, that's a that's a good question um, the I think the first if you the first step is to say I I can do this and realizing that toxicity has a, a, a fundamental chemistry component to it. And then looking at um, so some of the obvious things that, uh, that you know about and, you know, looking at um, the toxicity of pharmaceuticals, looking at, um, you know, the structure of aspirin. What is the structure of aspirin? It's an amine. So I know these things. So look for the familiar. Look for the things that you're used to, the dose response curve, you know, with, with our... Uh, <laughs> With the Patriots, I'm sure we've seen uh, a dose response curve with ethanol. You know, so. And then go to some of the resources like the National Library of Medicine and look at their site and then just gradually get into it and just start, you know, building up the, your toxicological toolbox and say, gee, it really isn't uh, as, um, as foreign to me as I thought it was. And because I am a chemist, because I am trained in chemistry, I can even go down further. And so start with the familiar and just, just start digging down a little bit deeper and deeper. And I think the anxiety will, uh, will dissipate very quickly because we're, um, you know, some, some of the first uh, scientists in the world, I think, were toxicologists. You know, should I eat that mushroom or shouldn't I eat that mushroom? Well, it was a field test, and mushrooms you shouldn't eat, you had a pile of, uh, you know, experimental uh, <laughs> data right there just laying on top of each other, and the ones you could eat, okay, now there's, there's an experiment. So we understand just intuitively what, you know, toxic and hazardous is. And so uh, just start small and, and uh, forge on. All right, terrific. And I do have another question here um, from Christine Kennedy. It's great that we're starting to include toxicity and in collegiate and post-grad instructions. However, is there a way to get something included into secondary schools, high school chemistry, so that even if you aren't a chem major, you can still have critical thought around toxics in your life? Yes. And I think <laughs> what we need to do is, oh, <laughs> that's my answer, yes. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think the same, the same um, advice would go for for younger for younger kids. You know, start off in, instead of using the ethanol example. Use, you know, gee, I ate too many cookies. Okay, there's a consequence of that, right? Okay, yes, there is. Mm. And uh, did you eat? Did you drink too much soda? Oh, yeah, I don't feel so good. Or you can go from the biological side because we're primarily talking about chemists, but. If you think about toxicology, there's also biological, protozoa, uh, radiological hazards that are that are toxic. So go from that side. You know, you've, you've got too many germs in you. You got you got a cold. You've got a fever. 
Oh, okay. So then you say, you know, I'm getting this dose response idea of things, some things may be bad. One of the examples that I use when I open up my uh, toxicology course over at UMass Boston is I ask the, <clears throat> I ask the um, students how many people had a salad that day for lunch, and I get several hands up. And I said, how did that arsenic and cyanide taste? And I generally get, you know, blank stares. And I, I say, arsenic and cyanide, both two acutely toxic chemicals, you eat every day because they're natural, but they were at a very low dose. So your body takes care of them. Oh, okay. How about peanut butter? You know, a few people raise their hand. Aflatoxin B1, which is a liver carcinogen, is on the peanuts. But Great. and we have we have ways of taking care of it. So there are many opportunities for everyday um, introducing, you know, concepts like this in everyday discussions, whether it's elementary school, high school, junior high, and continuing on up through uh, secondary education. Excellent. So before we get, to, there is definitely one. Um, we've got a couple more questions, and if we don't get to them all online, I promise we'll we'll do our best to get um, Nick to to um, give us give us an answer to that response, and we'll we'll get it back to you. Um, I do want to announce that Brett Lorenz is the winner of the Al Matlack book. So thank you for participating, um, and he's the proud winner of that. And I do have one more question I want to get in just, just before just before the 3 o'clock mark here. So, um, and this is, is there an online resource that has examples or problems that showcase the relationship between general organic mechanisms and toxicology? An online resource. Nothing that I know of online that is that is one one comprehensive resource. Um, if you go to <clears throat> the ORD website and look at uh, the National Center for uh, Computational Toxicology um, or the uh, dashboard out of the Chemical Safety and Sustainability Group, you will see uh, many examples that can be that can be used, and you can assemble uh, something for your own uh, for your own needs, but. Uh, unfortunately, right now, there's nothing that I know of. I'm not saying it's not out there, but I don't. I'm not aware of it. But that's that's an excellent, uh, um, an excellent task to undertake. Great. So there's just one one last slide that I'd I'd like to um, have up here. So once again, a, a big resounding thank you to Dr. Nicanathis. Well, thank you very much. And um, there was really active participation in this webinar, and we're really appreciative of that. Um, I would like to thank you again for listening, and all of the recordings and supporting documents will be posted on the website um, listed on this slide. So, and I'd like everyone to please join us for our next webinar, which is scheduled for February 17th. It will be a panel discussion by Dr. Marty Mulvihill from UC Berkeley, Dr. Doug Rainey from South Dakota State University, and Dr. John Warner from the Warner Babcock Institute and Simmons College. They will talk to us about some unique approaches for teaching toxicology, which will be a great build off of what we just got um, from this webinar. And you can view information about the upcoming webinars on the link that you see on the screen, as well as access the registration directly from that page. So thank you again for attending, and we look forward to seeing you on our next webinars. Have a great day. Great day.